Population Biology and Human Populations Part 1 introduces the J and S shaped growth curves typical of populations. The emphasis will be on the nature of exponential growth and the density dependent factors that result in the S shaped logistic curve. Keep these ideas in mind. The significant ideas are a species interacts with its abiotic and biotic environment, and its niche is described by these interactions. Secondly, populations change and respond to interactions with the environment. And lastly, any system has a carrying capacity for a given species. Here is the outline of the movies available for the Population Biology and Human Populations Unit. Use this outline to find the movie you need for review. This movie is focused here. A population is a group of interbreeding individuals, it's one species, that occupy a given area at a given time. A community is an assemblage of different species that interact within a defined area. The IB syllabus asks that you define the terms species, population, and community with references to local examples. We've been through these definitions earlier in the course, but here are the definitions once again for you to study. Here's the IB syllabus statement that really kicks off this movie. Describe and explain the S and J population growth curves. Now, as humans, we tend to favor thinking about humans, especially when we study populations. I want to encourage you to be applying all of the population concepts to populations other than humans. Now, remember, population size and population growth rates change and respond to interactions with the environment. Limiting factors will slow population growth rates as the population approaches carrying capacity. Limiting factors involve the community, food supply, predators, disease species, etc. Be thoughtful. The focus here is on populations, a single species, but the limiting factors that alter the rate of population growth involve the community. Be thoughtful. Keep your eye on the ball. Here is the J-shaped growth curve with population size, number of individuals on the y-axis over time. The curve displays exponential growth. The number added to the population increases with each unit of time. The number of individuals being added to the system is proportional to the amount already present. The bigger the system is, the greater the increase per unit time. Exponential growth results from positive feedback at the risk of being too simplistic, more adults of a species bearing more children of the species, more children results in more adults, thus even more adults bear more children, etc., etc. Positive feedback is when a change in the direction of a system causes further change in the same direction. Distinguish exponential growth from linear growth. With exponential growth, the number of individuals added to the population increases with each unit of time, while with linear growth, the number of individuals added to the population is the same per unit time. Exponential growth results from multiplying the size of the population by a factor, a multiplier. Exponential growth always involves a multiplier. We will name this multiplier later in the movie. This is an S-shaped growth curve, the logistic growth curve. Early in the overall time period, the growth is exponential and the size of the population increases. But at a certain point, an inflection point, the rate of growth begins to decline. Now be careful here. Population size continues to increase for some time, but the rate of growth decreases as the population grows. So the rate of growth decreases and decreases and decreases 
until the population grows no more, reaching carrying capacity, which is a number of individuals defined on the y-axis. At carrying capacity, the population changes very little, if at all, oscillating or fluctuating around this value, which is defined as the maximum number of individuals that the environment can support sustainably over time. In this slide, we can see the J-shaped curve, and we can see the S-shaped logistic curve. The growth in any population is purely a function of births and immigration balanced against deaths and emigration. The change in the size of the population, the change in the size of the population over time is delta n over the change in time. And this is due to the relative rates of births, deaths, immigration, and emigration. In time period one, the population grows slightly, thus the absolute number of births plus immigration must be greater than the absolute number of deaths plus emigration. In time period 2, the same is true, except the difference between births and deaths is greater than in time period 1. In time periods 3 and 4, we can see that the difference between births and deaths is quite small, approaching 0. Thus, the population no longer grows. So let me bear down on the details with this IB syllabus statement explain population growth curves in terms of numbers and rates. In this slide, I'm focused on describing the nature of exponential growth along the logistic curve seen here. Everything that I mentioned in this slide could be applied to the J-shaped curve. Now notice how the population gets larger each year, but more importantly, notice how the number of individuals added to the population each year is increasing through these first six years. This is exponential growth. The change in the number added, delta n, over the time period is increasing with each year. This is exponential growth. Maybe this slide will make the exponential growth more clear. I've asked, compare the difference in population growth rate, which is the change in the size of the population over time, between a one-year period, year three to four, versus a one-year period, five to six. Now you can see the number added to the population, three to four, which is one year, is this quantity, and it's less than the number added to the population, year five to six, also one year. Now the explanation for this difference in the delta N over delta T is that the size of the population is getting larger so the multiplier is being multiplied against an ever larger number. Remember that the change in the size of the population is a function of births, deaths, immigration, and emigration. And the relationship is shown right here. Change in the size of the population over the time period, change in the time period is a function of these four components. Now delta N over delta T change in the size of the population over the time period is known as the population growth rate. Now pay attention here because the multiplier has another name and you need to be able to keep them straight. So the change in the size of the population over the change in time is called the population growth rate. And you can see that the population growth rate is represented by the slope at any point in the curve. The slope here at time period A, time period A is smaller than the slope here at time period B. This is because the multiplier is being multiplied by an ever larger base population. But let's look, take a look at time period C. The population growth rate is zero, as it must be, because the size of the population is not changing. Ah, the size of the population is large, but the multiplier here has approached zero. Here is the S-shaped growth curve, population size, N, over time, early in time, 
we can see the hand indicating that the growth rate is rapid. But there's a moment in time, an inflection point, where the growth rate begins to slow. And then at carrying capacity, growth rate is negligible. The population is no longer changing size. The population size oscillates, fluctuates, around carrying capacity. Exponential growth involves a multiplier, a value multiplied by the size of the population n. The yearly change in the size of the population, delta n over the time period, delta t, is a function of both the multiplier and the size of the population. And this multiplier is called the natural increase rate. And we'll understand the origin of this value in the next movie. For now, through the rest of this movie, it's okay for you to understand that the natural increase rate is calculated using birth rates, immigration rates, death rates, and emigration rates. Actually, typically, most of the time, we eliminate immigration and emigration, and we simply calculate natural increase rate using birth rates and death rates. So in this slide, I've defined the terms, and I will no longer use the term multiplier for natural increase rate. Change in the size of the population over a time period is called the population growth rate. The multiplier, R, is known as the natural increase rate. N is simply the size of the population. And the change in the size over the time period is a function of both the natural increase rate and the size of the population. So in the red portion of this graph, the population growth rate, delta N over delta T, is indicated as rapid because the size of the population, N, is getting bigger with each time period. In blue, the population growth rate begins to slow. This is not because N is getting smaller. It's not. The population is continuing to grow. So if the population growth rate is slowing, that must mean that the natural increase rate is getting smaller. Maybe you can see it here as we compare the population growth rate, delta N over delta T, in three different years, 4 to 5, 5 to 6, and then 7 to 8. Now, the population growth rate for year 4 to 5, which is the change in N over the one year, is smaller then for the year 5 to 6, because the change in n is this value right here, the subtraction between these two values. Now, in other words, the population growth rate for 4 to 5, this value, is smaller than this value. The population growth rate increases from 4 to 5 to 5 to 6, and that's because the size of the population is getting bigger over the time period. But in year 7 to 8, the population growth rate is small again. And that's because natural increase rate, R, has gotten smaller since the inflection point roughly here in the growth of the population. Now, you may be wondering about the natural increase rate. And as I've mentioned, it's calculated using birth rates and death rates. And we'll get to that in part two. But for now, I want to mention that through this entire period until the inflection point, where it begins to decrease in magnitude, the natural increase rate through this period is, a, is at a biotic maximum. It's at a biotic maximum because the population is small enough that resources are relatively unlimited. I'll be strengthening this idea in part two as well. Here are two relevant IB syllabus statements. Describe the role of density dependent and density independent factors in the regulation of populations. Explain the concepts of limiting factors and carrying capacity in the context of population growth. In this slide, you can see the J and the S-shaped growth curves. Hopefully, you understand the nature of exponential growth, where the number of individuals added each year increases due to a factor multiplied by the size of the population, N. In the logistic model, as the population increases in size, the multiplier, the natural increase rate, begins to decline so that the population growth rate declines as the population reaches carrying capacity, resulting in the S-shaped curve. The population reaches carrying capacity 
which is the maximum number of individuals the environment can support sustainably. In this example, the maximum number or the carrying capacity is 1,000 individuals. You need to be able to define carrying capacity as the maximum number of individuals in a population that can be sustainably supported in a given area. Through this time period, the biotic potential is high because resources are effectively unlimited due to the relatively small numbers of individuals in the population. But at a certain population density, environmental factors begin to shrink the natural increase rate so that the population growth rate declines and the population approaches carrying capacity, the maximum number of individuals that can be sustainably supported in a given area. At this point in time, the population has reached carrying capacity. Natural increase rate is approximately zero, meaning that births and deaths are approximately equal. The inputs and the outputs are approximately equal, and this is equilibrium resulting from negative feedback processes. The population will oscillate around carrying capacity because any system change in a certain direction will trigger a mechanism in the system to reverse or dampen that change. This is negative feedback. What are the factors involved in negative feedback in the S-shaped logistic curve? And the answer is density dependent limiting factors. Early in the growth of a population, the S and the J-shaped curves are one. But in nature, once a population reaches a certain size, a certain density, the natural increase rate begins to decline because of environmental resistance, as it's called here, and the curve, the growth curve, becomes S-shaped. The natural increase rate is at a maximum through the early period of growth, and this is known as biotic maximum. Early on in the growth of a population, biotic potential is high. The reproductive rate is high because resources are effectively unlimited. But when the population reaches a critical number, a certain density above which the population can no longer increase at its biotic maximum, the environmental resistance factors begin to play a role, and this reduces the natural increase rate. The environmental resistance could be lack of food or nutrients, lack of water, lack of suitable habitat, increase in predators, increase in disease, increase in parasites, or an increase in competitors. Here are the density-dependent limiting factors that operate as negative feedback mechanisms. These factors represent the environmental resistance that I've been speaking about on the last few slides. Includes food supply, predator number, nutrient availability, maybe for plants particularly, light availability for plants, waste buildup, disease, nest sites, and competitors. There are density-independent factors that limit the growth of a population as well. These factors will limit population growth regardless of the size of the population, density independent. A hurricane, for example, will sweep across a small Caribbean island and reduce the population size of a species of birds regardless of how large or small the population might be, density independent. Here are relevant IB syllabus statements. Explain the nature and implications of growth in human populations degradation of the environment together with the consumption of finite resources would be expected to limit human population growth. Degradation of the environment is expected to limit human population growth. Air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, and climate change are all examples of environmental degradation. The consumption of finite resources would be expected to limit human population growth. Deep Groundwater is being extracted at rates higher than replacement. Groundwater, oil, are finite resources that will be difficult to replace. As finite resources become more and more scarce, limits will constrain human population growth. If human populations do not live sustainably, they will exceed carrying capacity. If human populations on Earth harvest Earth's resources at rates that exceed replacement, population will exceed 
carrying capacity, but only for so long before the size of the population would crash. The degradation could be such that carrying capacity is no longer what it was. If or when this happens, it will be a difficult time for humans on Earth. Exceeding carrying capacity is not sustainable. Sooner or later, the population will crash. Throughout this movie, I've been using models, graphs showing change in the size of populations. The models have been generally illustrative of what can happen to populations in nature, and they help us understand the general trends. However, the curves do not show actual data. They have not been quantitative, and they do not represent what is exactly occurring in nature with any specific population. You should be able to state two advantages of using models and two disadvantages. A model is a simplified version of reality to help understand how a system works. Models can be used to predict how the system will respond to change. But a model inevitably involves some approximation and therefore a loss of accuracy. Variables change, making predictions less accurate. Lastly, throughout this movie, I have implied that populations grow gently toward carrying capacity. I would like to dispel this notion. Once again, we've been looking at models to assist in our understanding of J and S-shaped curves. Populations can display a combination of both curves, where exponential growth results in a population size well over carrying capacity. The population then crashes back down, sometimes settling back at the original carrying capacity, or in other cases, below the original carrying capacity. We can see the J-shaped growth curve here resulting from positive feedback, and the S-shaped growth curve here resulting from negative feedback mechanisms. Here is a graph, an historical model of population growth in the human species over a very long period of time. Notice that at various points in time, the human population has grown, then plateaued, then grown, then plateaued, etc. New technologies, tool making allowed the population to grow before reaching a new carrying capacity. Then again, new technologies, the agricultural revolution pushed the population to a new carrying capacity. And then the Industrial Revolution, specifically the use of fossil fuels and agriculture, has pushed the human population into a time period of exponential growth that is not over yet. And our models do not know where the next carrying capacity might be. Do we know the carrying capacity of the human population on Earth? Remember that the carrying capacity is the number of individuals the environment can support sustainably over time. Is 8 billion the carrying capacity? 9 billion? 10 but more? We don't know because humans have the capacity to change carrying capacity. How? Humans have been able to increase NPP, kilograms of food per meter square per year, using new technologies. Humans could choose to consume how much resource we use, a bit less or a bit more, depending, or if society chooses to consume less, then effectively that increases carrying capacity. But if a society chooses to consume more, then this would decrease carrying capacity. Knowing carrying capacity for local populations is even more difficult because one population can trade with another. We will return to this concept later in the unit. Can you explain the nature and implications of growth in human populations. The nature of population growth will become more clear over the next six movies. In this graph, three models are provided, each of which predicts a different outcome based on potential values of fertility. The average number of children born to a woman in a population is known as the total fertility rate. If the TFR is high, the population will grow and grow and grow. What are the implications of this? If the TFR is modest, then maybe the world's population will plateau at around 10 billion people. Now, can you imagine 10 billion people on this earth? 
maybe national or international development policies will serve to reduce fertility and population size will gently and naturally decline. Now notice the phrase fertility assumption. The three curves are models based on hypothesized data, data assumptions. On the positive side of models, the three curves help us predict future growth, but the fertility assumptions are not quantitative. Thus, the projections are hypothetical. That brings us to the end of Population Biology and Human Populations, Part 1.